This episode is brought to you by Scribe. Scribe is my premium, high-level training for aspiring authors and accomplished authors. For a number of years, Scribe has been a live event. But recently, we've put the entire training online. So no more airfare expenses or hotel fees. No more face diapers. No more fear of catching a disease that was spawned by some guy who decided to eat a bat. <clears throat> you can watch the training videos and download the notes as well as the cheat sheets, all from the comfort of your own home. Plus, you'll receive over $6,000 in bonuses, which includes a private Facebook group where you will receive further coaching and connect with everyone who has gone through the training in the past. Scribe covers everything from how to write a successful book, to how to finish it, to how to get it published, and the hard part, how to promote it so that people beyond your family and best friends will want to buy it. Head over to attendscribe.com attend scribe all one word dot com and you can read all about it including testimonials from those who have gone through the training Welcome to another episode, a very special episode of The Best Known Church Show. If we haven't met before, I take full responsibility for that. My name is Justin Nava, the founder of Nava Church Marketing, where we want to help churches reach more people to bring them in, hear the gospel, and make disciples. But more importantly than that is my guest here. I'm very excited. The first guest on this show, we we, we are typically, or this show is typically a solo podcast show. Uh, but the first guest, when I had the opportunity to interview him, I jumped on that opportunity and I broke my own rule that this was just going to be a, a Justin Nava show. But I think this message from this guest here that we're going to talk today is so important. Uh, his book that we're going to be talking about today really caused me to introspect a lot on on my walk, my identity, uh, and really how I was even sharing the gospel with my friends and family. And not only that, it's also impacting a little bit about how we do business. So I want to introduce Frank Viola. He's a conference speaker, blogger, and best-selling author. He helps serious followers of Jesus know their Lord more deeply so they can experience real transformation and make a lasting impact. Viola's blog, frankviola.org, is regularly ranked in the top five of all Christian blogs on the web, and his podcast, Christ is All, reached number one in Canada and number two in the U.S. on Apple Podcasts. Frank, I am very glad to have you here. Thank you for your time today. Well, it is my honor, and uh, I'm sorry that you broke the rule with me. I will accept all the blame. Don't worry about that. But I picked up your, I picked up a couple of your books, and when this opportunity came up, I really wanted to dig into Insurgents. I think it's possibly one of the most needed resources and just book period that many Christians need to read, mm -hmm. especially the way that you break down actually the three types of kingdoms that we seem to have in today's culture. So I'm going to jump into some questions here that I have for you, Frank, and take as much time as you want, because as you can hear, I'm coming off a cold. Let me, let me just jump right into the first question. Your book gives us a unique look at worship that we don't often hear in churches today. And one of the insights that you uh, bring up is how we, bec we become what we worship. So what do you feel are the biggest temptations of American Christians regarding worship? Excellent question. And worship, I think, very often is restricted in the minds of many Christians to that one hour or 30 minutes on a Sunday morning where, you know, close your eyes, lift your hands, and <laughs> sing some songs. But according to Romans chapter 12, worship is a lifestyle for the Christian. And when we're talking about worship, we really mean adoration. We're talking about love and allegiance at the highest level. Now, the opposite, and this gets to your question, the opposite of worshiping appropriately, which is worshiping the only object of worship that's proper, and that is the living God, the opposite is idolatry. And the nature of all sin is selfishness, but the root of selfishness is idolatry always. So idolatry is really at the core of, of all that the Bible calls sin. Consequently, when a person is sinning in the New Testament and Old Testament viewpoint, they are either worshiping themselves or they're worshiping 
something in the created order that God has made. And this is made plain in Romans 1, Romans chapter 1. So in answer to the question, the biggest temptations, let me put it to you this way. When you read the Old Testament and you look at ancient history, people committed idolatry when they would carve these statues or images. <laughs> they would bow down to it. They would sacrifice to it. Well, in our contemporary culture, uh, at least in the West, we don't do that. But idolatry is very much alive, brother. <laughs> and the evil powers that stand behind all idols are still very much alive and active. So consequently, the biggest temptations, here you go right now. When a person gives their life over to power, they're seeking power. They are worshiping the false god of Kratos. He was an ancient pagan god. And when someone is giving themselves to power, they want to acquire power, they want to possess power, they're worshiping an evil spirit. They are committing idolatry, and that's exactly what the meaning of idolatry is. They're worshiping things created by God. When a person gives their life over to wealth, all right, they want to accumulate more, they want more money, they want more possessions, they're worshiping the god of Plutus. Okay, another name for him is Mammon, <laughs> and Jesus mentioned that by name, mentioned that God by name. And then when a person gives their life over to lust, they are worshiping the false god of Aphrodite. And in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, as well as in Psalms, in the Psalms, as well as in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we learn that evil spirits in the unseen realm are the powers that stand behind these idols. And that's why I mentioned them by name. And so idolatry is somewhat difficult to recognize in our time, but not really if you identify those three elements, <laughs> power, wealth, and lust, you are dealing with idolatry. And those are the three biggest temptations in answer to your question for American Christians, because they're all around us. Take any advertisement, for example, any commercial, whether it's on television or social media, they're going to be aimed at trying to lure you in to one of those three powers, one of those three idols. Either it's going to be a grab for wealth, a grab for earthly power, or it's going to appeal to the lust of the flesh. So that's the long answer to the question. And the book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom that we're discussing now, I deal with this in depth, and I walk readers through the scriptures to show how this is, in fact, a very real thing and a prevalent thing and a thing that Christians ought to be aware of, but the good news is they can't overcome all three. I, th I think that's, uh, if, and you're right, in the book you go even further in that, but even what you're saying right now, just hearing it is kind of making me reflect on, I had to grab my notebook, which I, I never do on my desk. So so I appreciate that. Uh, personally, for me as an anecdote, uh, determine the value in it. There's ha there's a half page chapter, if not three quarters of a page on uh, how we handle our money. And I had to stop reading because I had to personally just wrestle with that before we even got to the practice section of it. Uh, and really just kind of asking God to recapture my mind and just not even in money thoughts, but just possession thoughts mm -hmm. as well. So uh, I appreciate that. And, and speaking of the the sections of the books, you have a practical sec uh, practical section after each of the individual sections, the six sections that you talk about. Uh, you you have an entire section in the book where you discuss the world system as a counterfeit for the kingdom of God. But you discussed the origin of the world system and how it's captured the minds of many believers today. Can you share some of the uh, additional fascinating parallels you present in the book on how the three main elements of the world system, like how they show up in the Garden of Eden and also in the temptations of Jesus? Yeah, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. What I do in one of the parts of the book is I talk about the world system, a tale of two kingdoms, and the world system is the kingdom of darkness on this earth. And I have a chapter called The World System Conceived. How was it conceived? Where did it begin? I have a chapter on the birth of the world system and on and on. Now, let me just do a quick riff on this, and then I'll get to the temptations in the Garden of Eden and the temptations of Jesus and how they have striking parallels. Mm. When the New Testament talks about the world, right? Love not the world. 
Jesus said, the prince of this world has nothing in me. You know, come out of the world. It's talking about a system. The world system is a better translation of that term. And it began on earth after the fall in Genesis 4, when Cain went out from the presence of God and he built a city. And that city later became, in time, Babel, which later became Babylon, <laughs> which is a picture of the world system. And I point out in the book that when he left the presence of God and built this city, he did so independent of God. The human beings that God created, Adam, Eve, etc., were thrust out of the garden. And when Cain left the presence of God, he builds this city independent from God, apart from God, outside God's presence. And the city provided three things, provision, enjoyment, security. But they were all outside of God's presence and independent from God. Or in the Garden of Eden, they had those things, but they were in God and they were from God. All right, big mm -hmm. difference. And when you look at the temptations, we have to have as our basis 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read this out of, of the NASB. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world. He's talking about the world system, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. Now here he's going to give us three things. What's in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Those three things are not from the Father, they're from the world system. And the world, the world system is passing away with all its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. All right, so we have three things there, Justin. We've got the lust of the flesh, we've got the lust of the eyes, and we have the pride of life. Now, if we break this down, the lust of the flesh, that's the god of Aphrodite, <laughs> okay? The lust of the eyes, that's materialism covetousness that's the god of plutus and then we have the pride of life that's worldly power and ambition and security that's the god of kratos all right now when you look at the first temptation in the garden and there are three elements to it where eve was tempted by the serpent the scripture says in genesis 3 6 when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food that's the lust of the flesh and pleasing to the eye, that's the lust of the eyes, and also desirable for gaining wisdom so she would become like God, that's the pride of life. Mm. She took some of the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and ate it. Now, there's no problem with food. <laughs> there's no problem with you know living in a house, buying a car. There's no problem with any of those things, being successful. The problem is when it's independent from God. Yeah. And she disobeyed the Lord and she acted independently. And when we have those things or seek those things independent from God, all right, then we are committing idolatry. Now, these three temptations show up again in Jesus, who is the new Adam. All right. So what happened in the temptation in Luke chapter three? We have echoes of Genesis three when Eve was tempted, all right? Number one, the devil wanted Jesus to turn the stones into bread. That's the lust of the flesh. It wasn't that bread is wrong. It was God had led him through the Spirit into the wilderness to fast. He wasn't to eat bread. So that's the lust of the flesh. Number two, Satan wanted him to gaze at all the kingdoms and their glory and desire it for himself. That's the lust of the eyes. Three, he wanted him to jump down from the temple to prove that he was the Messiah. That's the pride of life. What's fascinating, too, is that we're told when Jesus was in the wilderness, Justin, he was with the wild animals. He was with the wild beasts. That's in Mark chapter 1. Well, that is an echo of Adam with the wild animals. Remember, God said, I want yep. you to name them. Here's something else. The Garden of Eden was understood to be replicated in the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. 
And Jesus came not only as the new Adam, he came as the new Israel. Out of Egypt have I called my son, Matthew chapter 2. Well, that was a reference to God bringing his son Israel out of Egypt. And then through the waters, God brought into the wilderness for 40 years Israel to be tested and tempted by the evil one. In the same way, Jesus, he's brought out of Egypt. Then as he grows to be a man, he goes through the waters of baptism. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness for 40 days to be tested by the evil one. So it's an echo of the Old Testament. When God created Israel, she was to be the fulfillment of what he wanted in the garden. But Israel was tempted in the wilderness with the same three things that Eve was tempted with <laughs> and that Jesus was tempted with, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the world system, brother. And this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. So all of this, the world system provides provision, security, enjoyment outside of God, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, independent from God, and that's what you have as the competitor to the kingdom of God. And God has given us provision and sufficiency and power to overcome all three, just as Jesus did in the wilderness. Now, Adam and Eve failed in the garden, <laughs> right? And Israel failed in the wilderness, but Jesus Christ overcame, and he gives us that same power and ability to do it in our own lives by his spirit. It's available, but the temptations are the same. Those three temptations that the world system offers are all the same, and they're repeated in every generation ever since the fall. Well put, and I, I want to talk about another another trinity, so to speak. Um in the book, Insurgents, you contrast the gospel of legalism and the gospel of, of libertinism or libertinism mm -hmm. with the gospel of the kingdom. What do you see as a greater threat to Christians in America? Is it the gospel of legalism or the gospel of <laughs> libertinism? Wow. That, that's a huge, that, that section alone is, is worth the price of admission to, to read this book. But <laughs> tell me, what do you see as the greatest threat to America the gospel of legalism or the gospel of liber libertin libertinism. There it That's is. That's a hard word for me. <laughs> it is a hard word. It's easier to read than say. It is. It is. Well, let me just do a quick riff for those who have yes, not. And, and yeah. Uh, so in the first century, there were two enemies of the true gospel, and Paul battled with them consistently. They were legalism and libertinism. All right. They're two extremes to the true the one and only true gospel. So what does the libertine gospel say? It says we're under grace, so we can do whatever we want. God's okay with it because he loves us, all right? <laughs> it's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness or license to sin, as Jude in the New Testament puts it. The legalist is the opposite. The gospel of legalism says, my personal convictions reflect God's opinions, so if it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you. Oh, and by the way, I'm not a legalist, because no legalist recognizes that they're in fact legalistic, all right? So to put it in a sentence, the libertine acts as if there is no God. The legalist acts as if she or he is God to everyone else. And every legalist lives by a double standard. I put it in an article uh, this way. Hey, Christian, why are you listening to Adele? She's an unbeliever. She sings the devil's tunes. Okay, well, that same person who utters those words and makes that judgment loves television shows and movies written, produced, directed, and scripted by unbelievers. All right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a double standard. So these are the two Gospels. In answer to your question, which is the biggest threat? Well, it really depends on what kind of church you attend, all right? Now, I'm going to choose my words very carefully. If you are a part of a Pentecostal church, a Nazarite church, a Church of Christ church, Disciples of Christ church, Nazarenes, 
if you are part of the reformed movement, especially the neo-reformed, if you are part of a fundamentalist church, then your church will tend, I use the word tend because there's always exceptions, mm -hmm. but it will tend toward the gospel of legalism, where you feel like you're not doing enough to please God. There is this Christian hangover of guilt constantly. Deep within your heart, you doubt that God really loves and accepts you, all right? It's a real struggle. And again, the other side of it is legalists tend to judge other people. Even though they have this internal struggle on their own, they will tend to set up their own convictions as being on a par with the law of Moses <laughs> and condemn everyone else. So those kinds of churches tend, the key word is tend to have legalism running in its bloodstream. Now, you may be part of one of these churches, and that's not the case, and that's wonderful. The libertine gospel is the exact opposite, all right? So any kind of progressive church, lots of your mainline denominations will tend to be, again, tend to be progressive and libertine. Again, the gospel is, well, you know, God's really more concerned with things like social justice and helping the poor than he is how you live your own personal life. And so many of the sins that the New Testament points out, the very things we talked about, you know, the world system, those are kind of ignored or justified or rationalized as being, well, we're human, God understands us. And sometimes in some of these particular churches, they will even be defended, like certain practices of the flesh that the New Testament clearly condemns will be reinterpreted to justify the lusts of the flesh and say God's okay with it. It's normal. It's normative, all right? So the answer to the question really depends on what kind of church you attend and what kind of gospel is being preached. I will say this, that the gospel of the kingdom transcends both legalism and libertinism. And just as was the case in the first century, when Jesus Christ came on the scene and began to preach the gospel of the kingdom, it caused the Sadducees and the Pharisees to become enraged and want to kill him, which they eventually did put him to death. And his gospel transcended both the messages they were preaching. The Sadducees were the modern-day progressive libertines. That's the gospel they were preaching. And the Pharisees were the modern-day conservative legalists. <laughs> That's the gospel they were preaching. It basically was the same gospel that I outlined in this book, only it was happening then. And we've got a replay of it today. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, it stood outside of either. And it set the person who was imbibing the gospel of legalism free from guilt, condemnation, judgmentalism. It set them free from being a Pharisee. On the other hand, the gospel of the kingdom sets those who have imbibed the libertine gospel, that grace is licensed to sin, it sets them free from bondage to the lust of the flesh, all right? That's why the gospel of the kingdom is so important and so needed. It's because it not only transcends, but it blows the soot out of both of the counterfeit gospels that we often hear today in the Christian world. I, I've got to I've got to use my lifeline because I got a burning question that I know my listeners are gonna are just their heart is just on fire right now to ask this. So I'm gonna speak up for them. We have I mean most of the listeners of the show are pastors. They're leading a church, and oh, many of them through talking in our in our discovery or just in in talking with them as a as a listener or potential client, they they share with me that they're they God's called them into a church. They want, they have the absolute, let's say they have 100% understanding of the kingdom of God versus, or the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of uh, uh, the supplement or the legalism. But the church they're coming into are full of legalists or are full <laughs> of libertines. What would you, what would you say to a pastor that, that is in that situation and says, what, what, how do I turn the ship? I mean, obviously we rely on the Holy Spirit. We, we go to God in this. Is there anything that you would say on that subject of if you're put in the leadership of the and you realize your flock is dealing with this? 
Well, the two parts to my answer, okay? The first one is I would not assume that the particular pastor, whoever it is, really understands the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom. And I say that based on this one observation. Before I wrote this book, I had passed through my hands just in every book that's ever been written on the kingdom of God, both from the past and the present, all right? I have looked at all of them. And while all of the books, well, I shouldn't say all, most of them had bits and pieces of the kingdom message, none of them did justice to what it was. They would always leave certain aspects out. And that's the whole reason why I wrote this book. I'm not a guy who just writes a book because, you know, I want to get an advance from the publisher or I just want to put something new into the world. I write the book that I want to read, but I cannot find anywhere. Hmm. And that gives me the justification to write the book. So the first thing I would say is, in answer to your question, I would challenge you to get a copy of Insurgents, whether the audio or the print or the digital, and read it from cover to cover. And not only that, but apply the taking action sections so that what I'm presenting here becomes a living reality in your own life. And I have had many, many, many pastors of all different denominations write me and say how this book changed their life. Not only their life, but their ministry. So that's the first thing, because you have to be very clear mm -hmm. on what the gospel of the kingdom is, and it has to be working in your life at some level before you can preach it and have impact. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is, if you really understand the gospel of the kingdom, and it's altered your life, okay? And typically, by altering your life, you are either coming from the gospel of legalism on, on the spectrum there, or you were coming from the gospel of libertinism on the spectrum there. And so your life was altered, and now it's becoming a part of your life. It's not just a message that you understand. It's a message you begin to live then you have to make a, a, a conscious choice in answering this question. What's more important to you? To present in all faithfulness the explosive gospel of the kingdom to the people who you serve or getting that paycheck and being in good favor with your supervisors. Because I could tell you this, if you present the gospel of the kingdom unflinching, without compromise, without any fear, and you're ready to accept the consequences, whether that means <laughs> you're going to develop some enemies, you're going to get hate mail, you are going to lose people, and you may even be fired. If you're willing to do that and say, Lord, I'm a vessel all in fully given to you, fully surrendered. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. I mean, the gospel of the kingdom got all the apostles killed, okay? And many of them were not killed by the pagans. They were killed by the religious system. John the Baptist was killed for the gospel of the kingdom because part of the gospel of the kingdom is the revelation that Jesus is king and not any other. And of course, Herod, you know, was posturing himself to be the king of Israel. And it also demands that you point out those things that are part of the world system that God is calling his people out of. And that will make some people angry. Also, if you point out the religious hypocrisy, which Jesus did in his scathing rebukes to the Pharisees, <laughs> Jesus was put to death by the religious system because of the gospel of the kingdom and all the other apostles as well. So if you're willing to count the cost and you're willing to pay it, then brother, sister, whoever you are, load both barrels and preach the gospel of the kingdom with all the fervor and passion and conviction that you have and see what God does. I love that. I love that last little punch right there. That was great. Um, real quick, because we're coming up on time here. I, I did want to get your views on Christian marketing. Yes. Many Christians think that marketing is a evil word. It's even a swear word if you use it in church and that Christians should, should never market resources. What do you have to say about that? Boy, I have, I have come across this. Two things. What marketing is, all it is, is making people aware of resources that will benefit them. Okay. So in that sense, evangelism, right? Sharing the gospel with other people is in fact marketing. 
What are you doing? You're making people aware of that which will benefit them. That's all it is. There is an article on my blog, and I would encourage every person listening to this, as well as yourself, to read it. It's called, Should Christians Sell, Market, and Promote Products and Services? Okay. But if your listeners go to frankviola.org, frankviola.org, and they click on the articles section, there's a search window. And all they have to do is put marketing <laughs> or market. Should Christians sell, market, and promote products and resources? So if marketing is simply making people aware of something, a product, a service, a message, whatever it is that will benefit them, there's nothing dark or sinister or evil in it. Now, it's gotten a bad rap because some people have used unethical tactics to try to manipulate people into purchasing a, a resource or a product or accepting a message or a piece of information or a piece of news that really isn't going to benefit them. It's going to benefit the person promoting it. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. That is manipulation. And that's why marketing has gotten a bad name. But if I have a newsletter that people opt into freely, which I do, all right, I have a newsletter I write every Thursday. One of the only newsletters I let in my primary inbox, by the way. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. That's a, that's a great compliment. Yeah, because we're being hit with so much every single day, email, social media, et cetera. So I, I take that as a great compliment. But I try to write a fresh article that's going to encourage the Lord to people, that will challenge, enlighten, comfort, whatever it is, whatever's on my heart, I write that in that article. And every Thursday. And so people voluntarily subscribe. They opt in. Now, those people who opt in, as soon as they opt in, we tell them what the ryth rhythm is going to be. You're going to get an article in your inbox every Thursday. And if Frank comes out with a new book or a new message or a new article or a new resource, a new course or whatever it is, we're going to let you know about it. We're going to let you know about it because you opted in. You're obviously saying, I'm interested, <laughs> right? Nobody put a gun to your head and yep. said, sign up. <laughs> so that's all it is. It's making people aware. And I'm working on a new book now. And from time to time, I will mention the book. It's not out yet. And I will just say, hey, you know, I'm working on this book. I'm on the 390th draft. <laughs> it has 2,000 footnotes. I hope it will come out in the next year or two. And people want to know that because I get responses. Oh, man, I can't wait until this comes out, you know, and they'll ask me questions about it. That's marketing. But all yeah. I'm doing is making people aware of something that I believe will benefit them. And so I hope that defangs the word for your listeners. Again, marketing can be unethical and manipulative. But marketing in itself is simply making people aware. And that can be done very ethically, and it can be very beneficial to people. I, I like being marketed that is made aware of products and resources or, or new television shows or a new movie that I'm interested in. I, I want to know about it. You know, I don't want to miss out, right? And so that's what marketing does. Do you have a top piece of advice for those who want to market Christian resources, books, courses, podcasts, videos? stuff like that. Just like one top piece of advice. Yes. And uh, you all listening to this will owe me $3,000 for this piece of advice. It is gold. All right. Now, if you are in ministry and you have something to offer people that will benefit them, you're going to get rejected by a segment of the people who you're putting that in front of. Okay. You may even get criticized. Maybe you're an author. I'm a I'm an author. I've written 20 plus books. And from time to time, someone will trash the book, <laughs> you know, in a review. That doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Now, I can look at that and take that personal and I can say, oh, my goodness, you know, this person's dense. Or I can turn it on myself and say, man, maybe I'm really not that good of a writer. Maybe I'm kidding myself. You know, maybe I shouldn't even have written this book, right? I can either blame the person or I can blame myself. But here is the titanium platinum piece of advice. It's, it's beyond gold. Five words. It was not for them. It was not for them. I'll give you a perfect example. I am a meat eater. 
at least at this time that we're recording this. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy meat. I enjoy vegetables. I enjoy fish. I enjoy eggs. Okay. Justin, if you take me out to dinner and you take me to a vegan restaurant, but only serves vegan food. Or we're in an alternate dimension right now. I'm just, just so the readers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's make this even more accurate. You take me to an Indian restaurant. Now, brother, I love all kinds of cuisines, all different dishes, all different nationalities and their foods, whether it's Asian, Korean, Italian, French. I love it all, except for Indian food. I do not like Indian food. So if you take me to an Indian restaurant, guess what? And you ask me, what'd you think of it? Give me a review, Frank. I am going to trash it. I'm going to say, Justin, I appreciate the sentiment. I'm glad you paid for it. Thank you for that. But I did not enjoy it at all. I did not like it. I give it a one star. Now, did I give it a one star because it was bad food? No. Did I give it a one star because the restaurant's lousy? No. I gave it a one star because it was not for me. And so if you are somebody who produces content in the Christian space, you're going to have people who view it like I view Indian food. It's not because what you did was bad. What you produced was inferior. It's not because you yourself should have never done it. It's because it wasn't for them. I think y'all owe me $5,000 for that piece of advice. Uh, man, we need, we need that all the time. <laughs> All the time. I think I think even when it just doesn't even come to resources, just our church. I think we internalize that a lot too. So whew, yeah, write that yeah. down, stick it. I'm gonna make a new wristband. That's cool. <laughs> it's not for them. And you can tattoo that on your forehead and even under your eyelids. Now that's not to say, that's not to say that somebody can offer you a piece of constructed feedback mm -hmm. and say, you know, I I felt you should have shortened this book or not use so many exclamation points. Criticism, if it's coming from a, a place of benefit and it's constructive, can be really helpful. So I'm, I'm not saying that. We don't want to dismiss yeah. everything. But by and large, the people who do not like what you're putting out very often, underscore very often, it's because it's not for them. I love it. How can people learn more about your book? And uh, for those that want to taste, do you have any free samples? Yes, sir. They can go to Insurgents, I-N-S-U-R-G-E-N-C-E, -E, insurgents.org, and they will find uh, reviews on the book, samples, where they can order it on discount, as well as supplemental resources. And we also have a podcast that supplements the book called The Insurgents Podcast. And that's on every podcast platform. And I have six different conversation partners, Michael Heiser being one of them. Unfortunately, he passed uh, this year earlier. Brilliant guy. And we did uh, some episodes together as well as uh, with five other conversation partners. And what we're doing right now, Justin, in that podcast is we are going through every reference to the kingdom of God in the New Testament chronologically and riffing on it. So it's a supplement to the book Insurgents. Awesome. Thank you, Frank, for being here. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insight. Uh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Hey, guys, this is a postscript just before you head out and we part ways. I have created a bundle of free resources. This would include my other podcasts, the YouTube channel, several free ebooks, free seminars, and other free resources. And you can find all of that at frankviola.com. And if you go to frankvella.com, you will see in the top menu a link that says free stuff. You just click on that and you will be taken to the free resources page. Also, a number of you have asked if you could donate to help defray the costs of the podcasts and also to express appreciation for the value that you've been receiving. You're under no obligation to donate. I don't ask for donations, but should you have it on your heart to do so, you can go to Frank Viola dot us that's frank viola dot us and that will take you to a donate page there's three different options you can use to donate all of them simple thank you very much and god bless <laughs>